Hello and welcome to Oathbreaking News, your Oathbreaker news source brought to you by the Signature Spellbomb. In this episode, we will be covering Core 2021 and Jumpstart set spoiler season so far. This is part two of our spoiler season episode, so please check out part one if you haven't. Just a quick reminder, if you like what we do here, then you can help us out by like, sharing, and subscribing to the channel. In the June 2nd article entitled Where to Find M21 in Jumpstart Previews, link in the description, Watsi outlined the full spoiler season for both new product lines starting on June 4th and continuing through June 20th. I'll place a link in the description so you can check out all of the cards spoiled so far. Let's cover a couple of the recently spoiled cards that are likely to affect the Oathbreaker format. I will save the Planeswalker deck cards for another video as we have a longer video plan concerning the curious case of Planeswalker decks. Since our last spoiler coverage video, which was over 30 minutes long, and they have spoiled anywhere between a few cards and 70 cards in a single day, I will not be covering additional printings or art and I will try to keep the coverage brief and to the point. On Saturday, June 6th, 2020, they spoiled the following card, Maze Mine Toem. It costs two, you can tap and put a page counter on it to scry one, pay two and tap it, put a page counter on it to draw a card, or when there are four more page counters on it, you exile it, and if you do, you gain four life. This is just a good all-around card. <laughs> Necromendia. For one and two black, you get a new sorcery. We can choose a card name other than a basic land card. We search opponent's graveyard hand and library for any number of cards with that name and exile them. That player shuffles their library and then creates a 2-2 black zombie creature token for each card exiled this way from their hand. This card will probably have no decent effect on Oathbreaker. It's... Next we have Malefic Scythe for one in a black. It's an artifact equipment card. It enters the battlefield with a soul counter on it. The equipped creature gets plus one plus one for each soul counter on it, and whenever the equipped creature dies, we put a one one counter on the scythe. It equips for one. This is a really great card for an aristocrat stack. It also means every time you put it on a creature, it gets a little bit better. Waker of Waves costs five and two blue is a seven seven whale. Creatures your opponent control get minus one minus zero, and we can pay one in a blue and discard Waker of Waves from our hand. Look at the top two cards of our library, put one of them into our hand, and the other into the graveyard. This is good top deck control, and in the late game, it's a beefy beater. Rewind costs two and two blue. This is a reprint. It counters target spell and lets you untap up to four lands. This card is often free the first time you play it, and as your signature spell, it stays cheap for a little while. Sometimes in certain decks, it even nets you some mana by untapping a land that could tap for two. Fungal Rebirth costs two and a green. We return target permanent card from a graveyard to our hand. If a creature died this turn, we also create two 1-1 one, one green sapling creature tokens. Seasoned Hollow Blade costs one and a white. It is a 3-1. We can discard a card and tap him, and he'll gain indestructible till end of turn. Moving on. On June 7th, 2020, they spoiled the following cards. Spined Megalodon for 5 and 2 blue is a creature shark. It's a 5-7 with hexproof. Whenever it attacks, we scry one. This is some great top deck control. It is kind of a late game beater, though, unless in a green-blue deck. Kiron Grub for 3 and a black is a 0-5. It gets plus X plus O, where X is the greatest power among creature cards in our graveyard. When Karen Grub enters the battlefield, we get to mill four cards. This is definitely a card that wants to be in dredge style decks or decks with grave robbing mechanics. I certainly would suggest tutors that allow you to put creatures directly from your deck into the graveyard, as you could certainly make this terrifying. On Monday, June 8th, they spoiled even more cards. We have Pride Malkin. It costs two and a green. It's a 2-1 cat. When it enters the battlefield, we put a 1-1 counter on target creature we control. Each creature we control with a 1-1 counter on it has trample. I would certainly put this into an Arlen Cord strategy deck or a Veraska strategy deck where you're automatically getting 1-1 counters on creatures. You might as well get the benefit of trample. Archfiend's Vessel costs one black. It's a 1-1 with lifelink. When it enters the battlefield, 
If it entered from your graveyard or you cast it from your graveyard, you get to exile it. If you do, you create a 5-5 black demon creature token with flying. A 1-1 one, one for 1 black is always good. The added bonus of finding a way to get a free 5-5 five, five flying demon is great evasion. And black certainly has ways to do that. Pursued Whale costs 5 and 2 blue. It's an 8-8 eight, eight whale creature. When Pursued Whale enters the battlefield, each of your opponents creates a 1-1 one, one red pirate creature token with this creature can't block and creatures you control attack each combat if able. Spells your opponent's cast that target Pursued Whale cost three more to cast. This is interesting because it puts combat on our turns, and in a Pillow Fort style strategy deck, it forces our opponents to attack each other while we remain relatively safe. Cultivate for two and a green is a sorcery. This is a reprint, so I'm not going to cover it any deeper than that. Or Scale Cordial costs one, a blue, and a green is a 2-2. Two, two. Whenever we draw a card, we put a 1-1 one, one counter on it. This, again, is a reprint, but that's an amazing ability for any blue deck that wants to go heavy into the draw and value. Angelic Ascension costs one and a white. We exile target creature or planeswalker, and its controller creates a 4-4 white angel creature token with flying. That's just good removal, especially if you already have a way to deal with 4-4 flying creatures or you have a way to make that token less of a threat. We just don't get a lot of removal with white without some sort of benefit for who we're giving it to. Again, there's no reason you couldn't use this on your own creature or planeswalker. Massacre Worm for 3 and 3 black is a reprint. It's a 6-5 worm creature when it enters the battlefield. Creatures our opponents control get minus 2, minus 2 till end of turn. Whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, that player loses 2 life. Massacre Worm is an excellent board wipe for many black strategies. It will decimate a token strategy deck, and that life loss is nothing to scoff at. Solemn Simulacrum for 4 mana is an artifact creature golem, a 2-2, also a reprint. So I'm not going to go much deeper into him than that. Vasari's Acolyte for 2 and 2 white is a cat cleric that's a 2-3. He has lifelink, and whenever Basari's Acolyte enters the battlefield, we put a 1-1 one, one counter on up to each of two other creatures we control. This is interesting because it has kind of a support style mechanic, and it does give us more of a background as to who this new Basari Planeswalker is, who I imagine we're going to see a lot of Oathbreaker decks around. Basari Solidarity costs one and a white. We put a 1-1 one, one counter on each creature we control. I could see this being a signature spell for certain white weenie decks. Basari's Lieutenant for three and a white is a human knight. He's a 3-4 with vigilance and protection from multicolored. Whenever he enters the battlefield, we put a 1-1 one, one counter on target creature we control. When Basari's Lieutenant or another creature we control dies, if it had a 1-1 one, one counter on it, we create a 2-2 white knight creature token with Vigilance. This is an excellent replacement effect, and it might actually be a little bit of board wipe protection for EDH and Oathbreaker. Next up, we have the man himself, Basari Ket. For 1 and 2 white, we get a legendary Planeswalker Basari with 3 loyalty. We can plus 1 as loyalty to put a 1-1 one -one counter on up to 1 target creature, and it'll gain indestructible till end of turn, which is a very Gideon-like effect. Minus two, whenever one or more non-token creatures attack this turn, we get to create that many 1-1 one -one white soldier creature tokens that are tapped in attacking, which is kind of an Elspeth ability since it cares about soldiers. Minus six, we get an emblem with, at the beginning of combat on our turn, we create a 1-1 one -one white soldier creature token, and then we put a 1-1 one -one counter on each creature we control. That is a terrifying and easy to get to emblem. For one black, we have Village Rites. As an additional cost to cast a spell, we sacrifice a creature and draw two cards. For one and two black, we have Pestilent Haze. We get to choose one when we cast a sorcery. Creatures get minus two, minus two till end of turn. Or we remove two loyalty counters from each Planeswalker. This is just, I think, really good for Oathbreaker, but that's a personal opinion. Next, we have Revitalize for one and a white. We gain three life and draw a card. That's okay, I guess. Radiant Fountain enters the battlefield. We gain two life and it can tap for a colorless. Chandra's Incinerator costs five and a red. It's a 6-6 six, six elemental creature that costs X less to cast, where X is the total amount of non-combat damage dealt to our opponent this turn. It has Trample, and whenever a source we control deals non-combat damage to an opponent, Chandra's Incinerator deals that much damage to our creature or planeswalker that player controls. 
This is an interesting damage doubling effect that we can't use to hit the player. It does seem like it would be really good in spell slinger decks or decks where the signature spell is a burn spell. Next we have Chandra's Pyreling for one in a red. It's a 1-3 elemental lizard. Whenever a source we control deals non-combat damage to an opponent, it gets plus one plus O oh until end of turn and gains double strike. That's just good and it kind of goes with the theme of the previous card. Chandra's Magmut costs one in a red. It's an elemental dog, 2-2. Two, two. And we can tap it to deal one damage to target player or planeswalker. Again, since this is non-combat damage, this will trigger the other two dogs we've read so far. Chandra Heart of Fire costs three and two red is a legendary planeswalker Chandra. She comes in play with five loyalty. Her plus one ability is to discard your hand and then exile the top three cards of your library. Until the end of turn, you may play those cards exiled this way. Wheel effects are good for when people are trying to storm combo off or with these other creatures we've read earlier in this section. Her second plus one lets her do three damage to any target. And her minus nine lets us search the graveyard and library for any number of red instants and sorcery cards, exile them, and then shuffle our library. We may cast them this turn and add six red mana. Again, that's really good for just throwing a bunch of damage and fire all at once. It's good for storm. I imagine we'll see some interesting decks built around her. I don't know how many, though, because that five cost kind of puts her out since she has no green to help us ramp. Bolt Hound for Tuna Red is a 2-2 with haste. Whenever it attacks, other creatures we control get plus one plus O till end of turn. That incidental anthem effect is kind of nice, but he is easily removed by a shock. Elder Gargaloth costs three and two green is a 6-6 beast with vigilance, reach, and trample. Elder Gargaroth attacks or blocks, we get to choose one, create a 3-3 beast creature token, gain three life, or draw a card. These are all excellent choices on this modular card. Faith's Feathers costs three and a white. We enchant a permanent. When it enters the battlefield, we gain four life. Enchant a permanent can attack, block, or its activated abilities can be activated unless they're mana abilities. So this is a more in-depth and life gain pathicism. Siege Striker costs two and a white. It's a 1-1 human soldier with double strike. Whenever it attacks, we may tap any number of untapped creatures we control, and it will get plus one, plus one until end of turn for each creature tapped this way. In the right token strategy deck, this could become a terrifying creature, maybe even striking for 20 out of nowhere with double strike. It'll be interesting to see what people build with him. Selfless Savior costs one white. It's a 1-1 one, one dog. We can sacrifice it, and another target creature we control gains indestructible till end of turn. This is really good just protection for a key creature. This is probably better in EDH than it is Oathbreaker, but it's still a good creature. Seeing the Truth costs one in blue. We can look at the top three cards of our library, put one of those cards into our hand, and the rest on the bottom of our library in any order. If this spell was cast from anywhere other than our hand, we put those cards into our hand instead. This feels like a card that's almost a must-run for the blue decks that want it. It seems like it would make an excellent signature spell. We'll just have to see what the meta decides to do. Kinetic Augur costs three and a red. It is an X attack and four defense human shaman with trample. Its power is equal to the number of instants and sorcery cards in our graveyard. And when it enters the battlefield, we can discard up to two cards and draw that many cards. The wheel effect will help us fix our hand and get more instants and sorceries. This does feel like a spell slinger ace kind of a card. It would be nice if it had some other evasion, but trample is something we will take. Tide Skimmer costs three and a blue. It's a two, three creature drake with flying. Whenever we attack with two or more creatures with flying, we get to draw a card. This incidental draw is almost always good, and flying is a form of useful evasion. That's going to be all of the cards I'll be covering today. We will be returning with additional spoiler season videos, so be on the lookout. I would like to take a minute here to talk about my LGS. This is not a paid promotion. I just want to support my friends at Mythic Games Colorado. Mythic Games is a gaming store for all ages located in Littleton, Colorado. They have a pleasant, attentive, and amazing staff that always helps me with our, my request. They stock hundreds of games and are willing to ship them directly to you. They have provided expert help when I have been working on deck lists and have filled my game and card orders in the past via Facebook Messenger and Twitter. When they haven't had a card or product I needed, they have always taken the time to suggest a suitable replacement, and I really do appreciate that. 
I will put all of their information in the comments below. Now that we have provided you with the news and our opinion, give us your thoughts in the comments below. What product this year are you most excited about? And is there a particular card from this new set that you must have? Also, this episode is a slightly different format, so let me know what you think and if you'd like me to continue to do videos in this manner. If you enjoy the video and want to support the channel, then please remember to like, share, and subscribe, and turn on notifications so you can be one of the first to see updated oath-breaking news stories. We have merchandise. If you want to show your support, please see the link in the description. Be sure to check out our new Run with the Booster Pack merchandise. If you want to support the channel directly, consider giving at patreon.com slash signature spellbomb or paypal.me slash signature spellbomb. We also have a Buy Me to Coffee link in the description. Again, a huge thank you to my viewers. I can't do this without you guys, and I wouldn't. Thanks again, and I hope I don't see you in the headlines.